and I was in his office when the, the head writer called up and passed on me, but hired one of Jackie's other writers. So oh, wow. that was a little bit of a disappointment, a career yes. challenge. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Definitely, yes. But, The Career Challenges Podcast, a collection of stories about overcoming professional hurdles and learning lessons the hard way. Thank you for joining me. I'm your host, Kai Workerly, Certified Ghostwriter. So welcome to uh, the Career Challenges Podcast, episode 14. Pretty sure it's 14. And I have with me uh, Kevin Kelton all the way from California. So, uh, Kevin, how, how are things going there in California? Well, they're going well. It's a little hot today, but yeah. uh, it's a beautiful June in, in California. We had a, uh, uh, an unreasonably cool May, but it's, it's getting very nice now. Yeah, we've been having a lot of rain here in San Antonio uh, to the point that a lot of businesses are – they just don't know what to do, but they're just not used to, to rain like that. And I actually grew up in Eureka, California, where it rained about 75% of the year. So the people here are flipping out when it rains longer than five minutes. I'm like, guys, you don't know anything. You don't know anything about rain. Well, that's the so, accurate weather report. Let's go to Kyle now for the rev- for the uh, for the traffic. Yeah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> if I had gotten that out cleaner, it would have been funny. Yes, true. It's all it's all about timing. Yeah. And you know, of course as as a writer, um what would you how important would you say timing is when you write a script? Oh, timing is everything. First of all, I should probably tell people who I am. Um Oh I've yes, been, let's do that. I'm sorry. You got me you got me distracted here. <laughs> <laughs> I have a tendency to do that to people. Um I've been a television writer uh, all of my adult life. I uh, started on game shows and then became a sketch comedy writer on shows like Fridays and Laugh Tracks and Comedy Break. And then I worked on Saturday Night Live for a few years, and that's one of my better-known credits. And that was in the mid-'80s when Eddie Murphy was on the show, and then um, Billy Crystal and Marty Short and Christopher Guest and Harry Shearer, all those people. Julia Louis-Dreyfus was there at that time. Uh, Continued to do sketch comedy for a few more years after that, then segued into writing half-hour comedies, what you would euphemistically call sitcoms. Mm -hmm. And I did that for another you know, 15 years or so, uh, worked on many different shows, the ones that are best known by people of, um, I hope this isn't patronizing, of your generation, Kyle, uh, would be um, uh, Boy Meets World. I worked on for for a couple of seasons. I worked on a show called Night Court, which you may be too young to have seen, but you might have Actually, seen it. Actually, I did watch Night Court. I did watch okay. Night Court, yes. And a show called A Different World, which took place at a black college in, in the South. And a lot of other shows that weren't quite as successful or didn't last quite as long. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So uh, let me jump back then. So back to my original question, when you, when you write a script, how important is, is timing? Well, timing is the key to comedy and every performer has a different sense of timing. The thing is you can anticipate timing in your writing, but you have to let go of it and let the performer put their own fingerprints on the material. Mm-hmm. So what I think might be the word that needs to be emphasized in a, in a line may not be the line, excuse me, may not be the word that the performer emphasizes, or they may try to hit something else that they think is funny in the scene or in the moment. So there's a lot of collaboration there and you also have to be able to let go because once it's on the page, it's no longer yours. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned working with, with Eddie Murphy, uh, Martin Short, Julia Louis Dreyfus, um, working with those those actors, and I, I know they probably weren't like big names at the time, but you know, working with them, did they kind of have their own style? And if so, did you have to you know adjust your writing to accommodate that style? Absolutely, yes to both questions, and that is really one of the key skills a television writer has to have. You know, if you're writing a pilot for a new series. Well, then you could put your stamp on it. But 90% of the writing in television is actually taking someone else's characters and someone else's world and duplicating it. I often told people that I felt that one of my skills as a writer was I was like the rich little of writing in that I could uh, mimic other people's voice, other people's writing style. 
And you need to do that to be a successful staff writer in television. So yes, uh, when you're writing an Eddie sketch, you have to know Eddie's mannerisms. You have to know Eddie's intonations, what he'll feel comfortable saying, what he won't be able to hit. The same thing with the other actors. You know whether they like more physical, whether they like line-driven comedy, and you have to you have to give them that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So how do you, I guess, take on that that persona when you're writing, say, for for Eddie Murphy, and you know Eddie Murphy likes it that way, or that the character that Eddie Murphy is going to play, he's going to play it, you know, this way. How can you get your your mind into that? I guess that mindset, for lack of a better word, I can't say it better than that. (laughs) Yeah, you just immerse yourself in their material. I mean, again, part of the skill is being able to do that. So maybe people who are successful at it have a natural affinity to that to begin with. Whereas a great novelist or a great screenwriter might struggle as a television writer because it's a different skill set. Awesome. And part of the reason I ask, too, is as a a ghostwriter, I do have to step into that role of the author right. as they would write that book. So they may not be a, a great author. I mean, they, they've got a lot of great things to say. They just don't have the time to really sit down and, and do the authoring things that would make them a good author. So it's my job to, you know, embody them as the author. Um, and I like to say it that way because it's, it's one that I think a lot of people can readily uh, latch onto and, and understand. But part of the irony is that I went to a Division three college, Howard Payne University, middle of nowhere, Texas. Um, I took one acting class there, but as part of that acting class, I was required to go and audition for their, their semester play, whatever that was. And I got the lead part. They offered me the lead part, but I said, ah, I really don't want to do it because I realized there was a lot of work involved with that. And acting just wasn't something that I was you know, interested in, really interested in at the time. I mean, I thought it would be fun. It was a nice little side, side jaunt. I just didn't really want to do that. So I go and tell my sister that she goes, but Kyle, you suck at acting. (laughs) Here I am just on this high, like, Oh, they offered me the lead, but I turned it down because it's not my style. And then my sister saying, well, you suck at acting. So that really brought me back down. Aren't siblings wonderful the way they instill positive energy in your life and confidence and they're so honest. They're so honest. You're like, I'm going to try this new thing. I really believe in myself. And they're like, yeah, but you suck at it. So right, yeah. What are you going to do yeah. when you fall on your face? Exactly. So let me ask you, Kyle, when you, when you do ghost author a book, and I assume that you're probably writing it not for really famous people, but maybe a CEO of a company mm-hmm. or some local leader who's asked you to help them with a book, you don't even have a body of work to, to jump off of. So how do you approach getting into their voice and into their head? That's a good question. Uh, if there is any sort of written material, sometimes it's not something they've put out to the public. It may be internal documents that they've written um, or a journal. Sometimes I've been handed a journal and say, here's, here's my thoughts. Here's how I write. What mm-hmm. can you do with that? Uh, and then sometimes they do have a little bit of a manuscript written and I can work with that. But most of the time I'm sitting down with them. I have a recorder or even a, a Zoom um, meeting like this and I just record it. And then I go and transcribe that. And as much as I hate transcribing, it is essential to the process of getting in their head by really listening to what they're saying. So I know what they, what to write on the transcript. I'm, you know, hearing their words and hearing their voice. And of course I have to listen to it two or three times to really get it down so that I can get my transcript correct. Right. And so uh, that's how I really get into their mind and get that, what I need in order to do a good job of writing for them. So. Right. So in the television business, we have an advantage because we have, you know, polished, well-produced, multi-million dollar episodes to look at <laughs> to say, oh, that's yeah. how he talks or that's his sense of humor. And but I will share with you that actually you use a good technique, which is transcribing their words mm-hmm. when you want to write for, let's say somebody wanted to write a Big Bang Theory script. Yeah. Well, the best one of the, the, the tricks, one of the great exercises you can do is watch an existing episode and transcribe it. And then you'll see what you've heard, but you'll see it on paper. And that will help you understand what a good line or a good scene for that show looks like. And when I was starting out as a writer, I took a lot of writing classes. I wrote a lot of sample scripts. I would go to a movie. And while I'm watching the movie in the theater, I would envision the page in front of me. And I would like, I would, it, like you'd see maybe on a commercial where you see letters typed out 
in mm. front of you. I would actually see the words typing out in front of me while I was listening to the dialogue. At a certain point, it started ru- ruining movies for me. Yeah. But, uh, but up until then, it was a very helpful uh, way to experience a movie a- as a script. Mm-hmm. Awesome. So that's, that's a good, uh, I feel would be a good piece of advice for an aspiring script writer to do it the way you said, Jim, transcribe an episode. Is there any other advice that you would give you know, a, a script writer? Oh, well, there's, there's tons of advice. I mm-hmm. mean, be more specific. Uh, first of all, find a show that you're passionate about mm-hmm. that has your sense of humor. Uh, watch as many episodes as possible. Get, the, get scripts from the show. It's not that hard to get a script from whether it's Veep or whether it's um, the, the Marvelous Mrs. Maisel or whatever, your, you know, whatever show it is. They're out there. They can be found. And read scripts, read that, ep- read that series, read other really good writing and, um, and write, 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 because there's no substitute for actually doing it. Amen. Amen. That's right. Awesome. So I was going to try and fit that in later on, but that's just how the conversation conversation went. So for you as a, a script writer, what was your first, I guess, big break? Uh, well, first of all, I had a little bit of luck in that um, I always enjoyed comedy growing up. We listened to comedy albums. We watched stand-ups on television. Uh, but I never thought of it as a, a, a career. Mm-hmm. Then my, my older brother went into stand-up comedy while I was in college. And so I hung out with him. And I would uh, go to the comedy clubs of New York with him, watch him perform, watch the other comics performing. I'd sit in the back of the room. And then I would hang out with him and his friends after the show and watch them banter with each other and help each other with their acts. So I kind of learned comedy writing through osmosis just by hanging out with Bobby. Mm -hmm. Um, And his friends, by the way, some of them went on to have amazing careers. You know, Bobby is not a household name, although he's been on television. You know, he he did like 21, 22 Tonight shows and did all the different, you know, shows that stand-ups could possibly be on. But his best friend was Larry David, and I hung out with Larry all the time. Wow. I was around, you know, when Jerry Seinfeld was just starting out, when Jay Leno was, you know, just a, a, a name club comic, but not a national name yet. Uh, David Letterman in, in his earlier incarnation. Uh, I saw all of these guys, you know, in the clubs and people that you may not know, but who were really well-known comics of that day. And so, like I said, just through osmosis, I learned to write comedy. Awesome. Awesome. So would you suggest, I guess, more advice for, for aspiring script writers? Would you suggest that for them, maybe go to a, a comedy club and just sit in the, the crowd and listen to the comic? And I guess maybe not tear it apart, but analyze how that comic puts together their jokes? I, I definitely recommend that. If you're interested in writing television comedy, I definitely recommend that. And the other thing is not just sitting in the back of the club, but hang out where the comics hang out Uh, in most of the clubs. There's usually a bar area or another non stage room where the comics have to hang out before or after their sets and yeah, befriend them, get to know them, know funny people. You're going to network, which of course is important in every industry. Mm -hmm. Um, And you're also going to expose yourself to the type of people that you want to be. Awesome. Awesome. So for you, you know, you, you, you're getting your start in writing. You were working with comics. Um, what was your first experience working with an agent? What was that like? Well, uh, I did have a little bit of luck in that my first agent was actually Bobby's agent. Oh. So she signed me. Um, and then, uh, but she couldn't really help me that much because she was really more of a, a stand up comedians agent than a television writing agent. Um, and I, I, the first real management I got was a, a, a guy who's no longer with us. He was an ex-stand-up who had become the, uh, well-known as managing writers, comedy writers. His name was Jackie Kahane. Mm. And by the time I met Jackie, he was probably in his early 60s. To me, he might as well have been 90. Because remember, <laughs> I was like 22 at the time. Mm. And I met him through a, a friend of mine who I had met at the comedy store. And Jackie signed me uh, and started sending out my material. I remember I was very close to, uh, I was being considered for a a job as a writer on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, and I was in his office when the the head writer called up 
and passed on me, but hired one of Jackie's other writers. So oh. that was a little bit of a disappointment, a career yes. challenge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Definitely. Yes. <laughs> but, but, but soon after that, Jackie got me my first um, sketch comedy job writing on a show called Fridays, which people who are real fans of television comedy may remember it. It was ABC's answer to Saturday Night Live. It was on Friday nights at 1130. It was a 70-minute sketch comedy show. Michael Richards was in the, uh, the cast. Coincidentally, my friend Larry David was also in the cast um, and a lot of other very funny people. So that was my first professional comedy writing job. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And you had mentioned uh, in your, your questionnaire and before we got to talking about how even with an agent, it's you yourself who's your own best advocate. And do you have a story that kind of highlights that or brings that into focus? Oh, yeah. There were, you know, uh, a few jobs that I got on my own. Now, agents did help me get most of my jobs. But uh, at one point, Jay Leno was getting ready to do a special for NBC. I knew him very casually through the clubs. Didn't really know him. He kind of, he, he, he knew who I was, but I didn't hang out with him. But I walked right up to him and I, I said, Jay, I read in Variety that you're doing an NBC special. These are my credits. Can I get you some material? And I ended up getting that job. Um, but uh, also sometimes negotiating the deals. When I started on Saturday Night Live, uh, they brought me in as, you know, a relatively inexperienced writer by their standards. And I was only making so much money. But uh, and, and if you got picked up for the second year, you got a little bump in your salary. But early in my second season there, I started getting a lot of material on. It just it clicked for me. I just figured out the system. Uh, the, the cast was easier to write for. And I was getting a lot of material on, but I was still making what I thought was not quite the salary that I was deserving. And I told my agent that. He said, well, let me look into it. And he calls me back a few days later. And by the way, this was a William Morris agent. This wasn't some schnook. This mm -hmm. was a guy who had major power in the business. He calls me back. He says, I got good news and bad news for you, Kevin. The good news is I spoke to Dick Ebersole and they love you. They think you're doing a great job. The bad news is they've got no more money for you. Now, I knew what the budget of the show was, and I knew what other people were making, and that was not acceptable for me. So I decided to go to the executive producer myself and ask for a raise. And we had a real out-and-out -out negotiation, which, which ended up in him yelling at me quite a bit, telling me that I don't know the budget, nobody tells him what the budget of the show is, and blah, blah, blah. But I persisted, and a couple of weeks later, he liked the fact that I... I uh, he had pitched an idea in a meeting that I said I could run with, and it really helped him that particular week. And he took me aside and he says, I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'm going to find you your extra money. And he did. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. And let me tell you, this was a guy, by the way, you can't tell on Skype, I'm a, a, a diminutive man. I'm not a large man. <laughs> and this guy was 6'4 and walked around the office with a bat. His, his thing was intimidation. So when this guy started yelling at me <laughs> across his desk, I'm quaking in, his, in my seat there, but I had to stand my ground and I did. Wow. Yeah. wow. So were, were a lot of producers like that? They just kind of, you know, kind of acting big and like, you know, don't mess with me. Was that no, kind actually of he, he was, uh, he, he, he was not typical. He, I haven't run into that too much. Okay. Now there are other power trips that people will play, but I've never seen that one before, which was physical intimidation. <laughs> Would you like to be a guest on the Career Challenges Podcast? Visit careerchallengespodcast.com to find out how. And while you're there, listen to all available episodes and subscribe through Spreaker, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and CastBox. More outlets are coming soon. The Career Challenges Podcast is produced by me, Kyle Weckerly, and I'm a certified ghostwriter. A little bit more about that. I work almost exclusively with business authors. I've worked with authors who are coaches, consultants, mentors, speakers, some high-ticket salespeople, C-level executives, and, of course, business owners. My authors have worked for USAA, Vistage, Booz Allen Hamilton, Austin Technology Council, and the John Maxwell team. They want to write a book. And they want that book to help them expand their business. See, with a book in hand, they're able to market their expertise, or secure more speaking gigs, or promote their company, or all three, or maybe even more than that. They're not out to write a bestseller, though that would be nice. 
Instead, they have years of knowledge and experience, and sorting it out will be no easy task. More importantly, they want all that knowledge and experience to be an engaging read. To learn more about how you can become an author, visit WeckerlyWriter.com. That's W-E-C-K-E-R-L-Y-W-R-I-T-E-R.com. And schedule a consultation today. And now, back to the Career Challenges Podcast. So as you're working your way up through the writing ranks um, and you're, you're trying to figure out more in the industry, um, where was it that you came upon the idea that, you know, you kind of need to be nice to everybody uh, because someday that that person may actually be the one who decides whether you get a job or not, even though the, right now they're just a lowly assistant. Yeah, no, I just saw that pattern happen over and over and over again. The person who was a production assistant or a secretary or a, a writer's assistant uh, ended up becoming executive producers of some great shows, The Simpsons and Family Guy, uh, have, you know, executive producers on those shows were people that used to, you know, not get me my coffee, but essentially they were our assistants when I was, you know, in the, in the thick of it. And I just saw that pattern and I realized, man, it helps to be nice to everybody because someday you're going to want them to be nice back. Um, so yeah. And there were people, by the way, I made a, a few mistakes along the way where I wasn't as nice and I paid for it. So mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> be nice folks. It's a lot easier than, than making amends afterwards. <laughs> true. True. I can speak from experience on that one too. So I'm, I'm just curious too, how, um, people are able to move up that way. You know, they, they're the assistant or they're the gopher and yet someday they're, they're the executive producer. Um, can you shed some insight on that? I sure can. Well, again, in television, well, let me back up. As you know, in movies, the director is the auteur. Yes. And, and uh, producers have some power, especially if they're stars who happen to be producers, and they can get a movie made. In television, it's a very different medium, and the writer is the king. And that's why showrunners generally are the people that wrote the pilot and are running the show and running the writing staff. So they're not necessarily executives. They're certainly not directors. But because the material is what feeds a television show, uh, showrunners, executive producers, usually come from the writing uh, pool. Mm -hmm. So these people who were production assistants were doing what I did to break into the business. They were writing spec scripts on the side, getting better at it, writing spec after spec, getting their first writing break, and then their second, and then getting a staff job, and moving up the ladder on shows. That's how it happens. Mm -hmm. So when they become the executive producers, the showrunners, um, do they still have that creative control? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Executive producers in TV, like I said, 90% of them are writers or have some you know, creative side to them. They're not necessarily business people. And um, yes, they have full creative control over the series. Uh, people like Shonda Rhimes, um, David mm -hmm. Kelly, who was big several years ago, Aaron Sorkin, everybody knows him, yes. uh, Larry David. These are the power people in television because they can turn out material that people want to watch. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And why, what do you feel gives them that ability to write what people want to watch? Wow. If I knew the answer to that, uh, I'd, be, I'd be talking to you on a much nicer laptop. There um, go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, what is it? it it's innate. It's something, I don't think you can learn it in a book or a course. Some people just have a knack for storytelling. They have a knack for understanding what the market wants. For instance, I think this is generally well known that when Seinfeld was first created, it did not test well and the network did not think it was going to be a big success. And they wanted Larry to make a lot of changes to it. But Larry and Jerry Seinfeld held their ground because they felt that they were making the show they wanted to watch and they wanted to show to their friends. And that worked for them. And it generally works for talented people. Now, the double-edged sword is if you're not that talented, that can backfire on you. Mm -hmm. but, but shows that, that succeed and run for five, seven, ten years, generally there's, there's a showrunner or a, a, a staff of creative people who didn't listen to the network 
and did what they thought the market wanted to hear. And for whatever reason, they were right at that moment in time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you mentioned Seinfeld and, you know, all these other shows that people probably know right off the top of their head. Oh, that's a great show. There's six, seven, 10, 12 seasons to it. Obviously it's done very well, but what is your kind of favorite show or a hidden gem that you feel uh, just didn't get its chance or just didn't have a shot? Oh, that's great. There were so many. Well, first of all, news radio, it actually did have a shot. Wow. And I think it I came to an end when, when Phil Hartman, uh, you know, tragically passed yeah. away. Yeah. Uh, they did one more season after that with John Lovitz trying to, to front the show. But uh, that was that was a gem. It wasn't a hidden show. I mean, it was on the, the NBC schedule for five years. <laughs> um, there was Chris Elliott had a show on Fox many years ago. Get a Life, I believe, was the title of it. And you know I remember who, watching, Elliot? yeah, I remember watching promos for that when I was a kid. Yeah, and th- that cracked me up. Um, and uh, yeah, if I had you know the DVDs of those, I'd probably be watching them regularly. And there's probably a lot more shows like that that I'm not thinking of right now, but they're out there. Yeah, yeah. My, you mentioned news radio, and that that brought flashbacks to my mind because they they put it in into syndication after it went off the air, and that's when my brother and I finally got to see it. Because, you know, during prime time, it was what my parents wanted to watch. They didn't let the kids want to watch it because sure. we had one TV in the whole house, a 13-inch oh screen TV, no remote. And it had the two dials, you know? So you had one through 13 on the top and then, like, 14 through 29 on the bottom, whatever it was. I remember those TVs. Sure. Yeah. The UHF channels. Yeah. Yeah, UHF and then the VHF. And so we, we had to turn the dial if we wanted to watch a different program. And you had to sit through the commercials. You didn't yeah. get, you couldn't binge watch. You couldn't, you know, uh, DVR past it. And if you wanted to record something, you had to set up a VCR to do all that anyway. Um, so we have this 13 inch screen TV. We couldn't watch really what we wanted to watch during prime time. But as we got older and my parents would go to bed at, you know, nine or 10 and my brother and I wanted to stay up, we started watching those, those things in syndication on the, the five channels that we had. And one of them was news radio. And we really just fell in love with it. We thought it was hilarious. I knew who Phil Hartman was because I'd seen him in, in Small Soldiers and Jingle All the Way, which, you know, were, were kids' movies. So obviously it wasn't his, quite his uh, wheelhouse. And I got to see him in News Radio, and I thought, this guy's hilarious. It's great stuff. And we, we laughed so hard at the season four premiere when um, Joe Rogan, his character, just literally is jumping out of windows. And we thought that was the funniest thing. And we were, we were just dying laughing. And, you know, Stephen Rood and Dave Foley and more attorney, they were doing great stuff on that show. And like, I see them now and other stuff. I'm like, I remember when they were you know on news radio and they were great then. Yeah. And, you know, and they, they're doing well now. I just wish they had more, more stardom, especially, you know, Dave Foley. I, I haven't seen him do too much on TV anymore, but I think he was, a really good comedic actor. And he I was really great in that him. series. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And you know, it's interesting. You mentioned more attorney. I worked on a TV show in 1988 or 89 called uh, Van Dyke and son. Um, and it was a Dick Van Dyke series and it was her first TV job. And we thought that she was, re- and she was like 20 years old or something like that. Wow. And we thought she was really talented back then. Also, um, yeah, Stephen Root used to do uh, guest appearances on night court. Mm-hmm. And and now, you know, whenever I see him, whether it's in Barry or, of course, he was in office space and he's been in a lot of things. He's always good. He's amazingly good. Yeah. And yeah. He, he like him and Robin Williams could do this, too. They could do comedic roles that were just funny. I mean, you could you would laugh so hard because they they were so good at it. But then they could do a super serious, just creepy role that just scared you because uh, Stephen Root in a uh, get out. I mean, he was, I was like, man, that guy is freaking me out. If I hadn't seen him do comedy, I wouldn't want to approach him in person at all. <laughs> just because the way he, you know, even though he's blind, just his, his right. the whole time, I'm like, my gosh, dude, you're freaking me out. Yeah. And, and of course, Bradley uh, Whitford, he, did, he does comedy and he does serious roles really well. Mm-hmm. But uh, anyway, uh, so. You're, keep- you're, you know your stuff. You're an aficionado. Yes, I, I, I watched a lot of TV growing up, which is probably why I'm socially awkward. Um, <laughs> but yeah, like I said, we only had those five those five channels. One of them was PBS. The other four, you know, NBC, ABC, CBS, and PBS. 
and so we we got to watch those or Fox. We got Fox when I was twelve, and that was a big thing for me. We we went from four channels to five channels, and that was huge. And we finally got to watch Saturday morning cartoons of like the X Men and Batman, and that was that was huge for so, us. So let me ask you this: Fox, of course, their first big hit was Married with Children, and yeah. you remember that. They were trying to follow up and come up with a, a second show. And I worked on a series that was one of their attempts at building out their Sunday night. It was called Women in Prison. Do you by any chance remember that? I don't know. If I did, it was probably because my parents didn't want me to watch it. Yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is my dad for you. This, this sums up my father perfectly to a T. We got Fox. We started watching. My brother and I started watching Fox more and more. We're like, this is hilarious. We love what's on this show. TV show or this channel because it was way more than what the other uh, broadcast channels were offering. They actually had cartoons during the weekday yeah. and the other channels wouldn't do that. We, right. we, we were frustrated. And so we finally got to watch Fox and power Rangers and Batman and all that. Right. And so my dad's like, you watch Fox and you're going to go to hell. And so we're like, uh, okay. And you know, at that age, you know, my dad is this very towering and imposing figure, but come Saturday and Sunday football's on. And what channel is he watching football on? He's watching it on Fox. Right, right. <laughs> so I'm like, you hypocrite. And he's like, it's, it's football. It doesn't matter. I'm like, no, no. You said if you watch Fox, you're going to hell. And so it shouldn't matter if it's football. You're going to hell. <laughs> right. That's so funny. Well, when uh, I have two kids who are now college age. Mm -hmm. um, but when they were, you know, 10 years ago when they were younger, at first they really liked to watch things like Full House and, oh, and yeah. real soft comedies. And for a guy like me, it was like, bad music in the background all day long. It was driving me nuts. And so I finally decided, even though I knew it was not good parenting, I let them watch Family Guy because it was a show we could watch together. And um, my kids, you know, they turned out pretty well so far. They've got great senses of humor. Family Guy didn't kill them. So <laughs> true, true. And I remember watching that when it first came out and thought it was, it was really good, really entertaining. Um, and it kind of, that will also that and a bunch of other animated movies and, and uh, computer animated made me want to be an animator for a while. Um, but, you know, it's here in San Antonio, Texas, there's just not a lot of opportunity. And I graduated in 08, right when the economy tanked. And so whatever opportunity at that time to become an animator, I feel just went up in smoke. Now, I'm not saying I can't never be an animator. I know a lot of people would would jump on me for saying that, but it was just something that had never materialized at that time for me. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, back to the show though, back to the show. <laughs> um, you talked about taking criticism. Um, Cause you know, you, you had talked to this producer about getting a raise and he's like, you know, you don't know anything about that. And then you're, you're writing for Eddie Murphy and Julia Louis Dreyfus and Martin short. Um, and I, I assume they had, you know, constructive feedback for you. No, the actors actually did it because that just was the etiquette. Um, your, your, your stuff either got in or it didn't. Now, on half hours, it's a little tougher because you do rewrites of the scripts, what they call in the room, in the writer's room. And you have to be – the first time uh, one of my – one of my – excuse me, one of my scripts was being rewritten by the staff while I was there. I forget what show it was on. It might have been Women in Prison. Um, the showrunner said to me, I wish we had some duct tape because right now what I'd like to do is, is tape you into your chair because you're going to be in a few minutes, you're going to want to jump out of your chair because this is going to drive you nuts, this process. So I think it was a she and she said, so just be aware right now, sit back, shut up. You're not going to like this process, but believe me, the script's going to turn out better in the end. And, mm -hmm. and, and she was right. And that's the process in television. Uh, talk about constructive criticism. When I was, I, I was already working on Friday, so I was already a professional writer. But I was trying to get further ahead in, in the business, and I was writing these spec scripts for different shows, and I wrote a Barney Miller spec script. And someone told me – I was a, a hockey coach when I first came out to L.A. I played hockey in high school. I'm a good skater. And so that was my way of, like, you know, being grounded, doing something other than show business. So I was coaching this boys' hockey team, and somebody told me that one of the kids' dad – was a well-known manager of comedy writers, and I should contact him and show him my stuff. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I remember his name, but I won't say the whole name. His first name was Harvey. And uh, I get him this Barney Miller script of mine, 
which by the way, the people at Barney Miller had read and liked enough to bring me in to pitch ideas. So I get him this script and he calls me up about a week or two later, tells me to meet him at, at the mall. I meet this guy. Again, I'm like 23, 24. He's a guy in his 40s or 50s. So there's a real power, you know, age thing there. And he starts asking me, you know, why do you want to be a writer? What do you want to do with your life? You know, blah, blah, blah. And he says, you're probably wondering why I'm asking you all these questions. I said, yeah, I kind of am. He said, well, I read your script and uh, I'm not going to beat around the bush. I thought it was pretty bad. I don't think you understood the show. I don't think you got the characters. I didn't think it was funny. I didn't like the story. <laughs> I mean, he, he eviscerated this script. Oh my gosh. Now, some people might have crumbled under that because this guy supposedly knew what he was talking about, right? But I'm listening to this feedback and I'm thinking to myself, well, first of all, I'm already getting paid to write comedy, so I must have some talent. And secondly, I think it's good. And third, the people at Barney Miller thought it was good enough to bring me in to hear other ideas of mine. So I thanked him for his feedback. I didn't get angry, but I said, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to think about it. Thank you. I'm going to look at the script again. But frankly, Harvey, I, I, I think that maybe you're missing something and, and I'm going to just continue on down this road because I, I think I'm going to be okay. And thank God I didn't listen to him. Now, let me put a, a big asterisk on that. That doesn't mean that if people tell you your material sucks, that you should continue writing forever because some people are not meant to do this or maybe it's, it's another industry altogether that you're not cut out for. Maybe it's photography. Maybe it's music. Maybe it's mm-hmm. finance. So, the, you know, you do have to know when to, to call it, you know, call it quits and move on to something else. Um, but you also have to have that inner fortitude to say, well, I'm not quite there yet and I want to play this out. I want to take the risk, you know, play my cards a little further along and, and have the balls to, to fail. Luckily it worked out for me. It doesn't work out for everybody, but you know, starting out in the world, you know, a young guy like you, and I'm, again, I don't want to sound patronizing, but I see you as a young man. That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> um, I would say take risks now because better you should take a risk and lose a couple of years trying to do what you love than to make a living at something that you really don't like and to look back 20 years later and have regrets. Sure. Sure. I've gotten that advice a lot too. So, uh, so it must be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no. no, I've gotten it from, uh, from other, other ghostwriters as well who, who told me that, you know, you're still relatively young and you, should, you can still, you can still make a go of it. So don't, don't be afraid, go out there and get it. And well, I, what would be your dream I, path? My dream path, uh, well, obviously, you know, I, I enjoy the podcasting, but to be ghostwriting, um, you know, more, have a more steady stream of ghostwriting clients. And it, it is working for me right now, but of course it's not where I want to be, but I'm not, I'm not uh, harshing on it at all. But there are some ghostwriters out there who, who are making six figures a year solely from ghostwriting, and they're not in Hollywood. They're not in New York. They're not in, in any quote unquote major metropolitan area, but they're making it work. They're doing a hundred thousand uh, uh, well, you need revenue one every year. Break. You need one ghost written book that, that breaks big. That's True. All. And then there, there is another ghostwriter who I, who I know of. He does just two projects a year and charges 300 K per project. And he just does, does two of them a year. And I'm like, I would love to be at that level. Now, so of course, if I, if, yeah, definitely. Who, who wouldn't? Who wouldn't? <laughs> because I love sitting down and writing out. And you had asked me about the process. And here we are talking story. And it's like, that's what I love to do. Uh, you know, really get into that and go back and, and do some writing. Um, but, you know, if, if I make that my goal to, you know, I, would, I just want to do two projects a year, 300K, that's the wrong goal. You know, I'm just, I'm shooting for a numeric value. So it's like, I have to figure out what it is I need to shoot for in order to get you know, the byproduct being those two a year at 300K. Well, I assume that you're ghostwriting nonfiction books, right? Definitely, yes. Okay, business books or biographies, things like that. Yes. Is, is that what you want to do or do you want to write a novel or do you want to maybe get into screenwriting or something else? I, I would really love writing novels. I'm not sure about screenwriting. Um, I've only written one or two scripts, but they were very small, of course, for ad agencies here yeah, in yeah. San Antonio. And so to, to write a whole movie or even a 30 minute uh, sitcom, I, I'm like, I'm not sure I can quite grasp that because you really got to break it down into the dialogue or any sort of physical description. 
I understand it has to be very lean. So that way you give the director and the producers and the photographers and all that more leeway to, to bring that idea to, to fruition. So for me, it's, it's harder. It's harder for me to wrap my head around that because when I'm writing a novel, I get to create everything. Now, of course I'll take feedback and, and uh, constructive criticism from other people and adjust how I need to, but you know, 90 or 80, 90, 95% of that novel writing process, it's me in the, in the chair and you know, maybe that's just me being young. Yeah, well, so that's what you're comfortable with. I'm just the opposite. So I struggle with novels. You, st- you might, I don't know that you would, but you seem to feel that you might struggle at first with a, a more scripted uh, narrative. Yeah. And, and I haven't really tried to, yeah. yeah. And I haven't really tried a full script. Maybe I would be good at that, but right now I'm just focusing on the novels. Yeah. So. Cool, great. <laughs> awesome. So uh, you talked about writing scripts. Uh, how long generally is a 30 minute sitcom script? Single spaced, it could be 34 to 38 pages, give or take a couple here or there. Some shows write long and shoot long. Like I understand that the show Veep, which by the way was one of my favorite sitcoms, mm-hmm. uh, that they had scripts that ran 60, 70 pages, which is really long, but they shot a lot and cut a lot. And that's one of the ways that they you know, achieved such a high level of quality. But generally, again, it's about a minute a page. So maybe, you know, three quarters of a minute a page. Okay. Huh. Interesting. So have you ever had a, I know this, you've probably heard this before, or somebody's posed it before, but has there ever been an episode where they're like, we want to do more the physical or the visual kind of gags. Can you write us something like that? What is your? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And again, depending, I mean, Night Court comes to mind as one that was a little bit more slapsticky. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, and, and you do it because that's the nature of your job is to mimic the style of the show. Mm-hmm. We're coming to the end of the show, but I do want to give you the opportunity to talk about what's next for you. What's coming up that you're excited about okay. and want to talk about? Well, on the theme of career challenges, I'm going to tell you a little yes. bit of a story about me. So, Yes, please do. I had... Uh, a very successful career writing in television. Don't write so much anymore, although I do have, I did work on a, a web series the last couple of years, and I've got a new web series that I helped out with. I didn't write it, but I helped with the writing. That's coming out uh, sometime in 2019. That's called Biffle. Um, Breathe in for life. is It's an acronym for that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not going to tell you a whole lot about that because, frankly, I don't make any money off of it. <laughs> but but with where I was going is, I've always had another passion, which is news and politics. In fact, when I was in college, I had an internship at the local NBC uh, television station working in the newsroom there. And I almost got a full-time job after college there. And that would have taken me in a whole different path. But the path that I went on was great. I had a wonderful career. But I still love following the news. I watch cable news constantly. And when I was looking to reinvent myself, I've reinvented myself a couple of times. The first time I took my skills at writing into the business world and became what they call an instructional designer. I would write courses uh, for businesses, for companies to explain their business ethics and compliance program, to explain their code of conduct to their employees. So it was a different kind of writing and I reinvented myself and had a seven year career doing that. And then when I didn't want to do that anymore, I wanted to get back to my passion, which was news and politics. Well, at that point, I was in my 50s, and nobody was going to give a starting job (laughs) to a guy in his 50s. So I would go on Monster.com and the other, you know, career builder and everything looking for jobs. And one day I see, and I would apply for these jobs as a news writer at the local CBS station. or the None of them would ever get back to me because I didn't have any credits. Mm. Then I saw that my local radio station, I live in a small town in northern Los Angeles County, and it has a very small radio station here, and they were looking for a news intern. Now, I'm sure that they had designed that job for someone who was in the local college, and they were probably surprised when I called up and asked if I could come in and interview for it. I went in, I met with the news director who was about 25 years younger than me, maybe, (laughs) maybe a bigger span than that. And he gave me this internship. So at 56 years old, I took an unpaid internship because I wanted to reinvent myself. Now that at a certain point became a paying gig. And I did that for a little while. 
And then they let me go over budget issues. And um, actually, I think it was politics. I, I don't think they liked my <laughs> politics, but they said it was budget issues. <laughs> there you go. But, cover, cover with the money. But in that job, I learned how to edit audio. I learned how to do interviews. I, I did some, some blogging, you know, covering news stories. And when podcasting started to become a thing that people like you and I could do, and someone came to me and said, hey, would you like to do a news and politics podcast? I had enough skills that I was ready to take that on. And so what I do now is like you, I host, well, I co-host a weekly podcast called the More Perfect Union Podcast. And it's about news and politics, but we do something slightly different. Uh, it's four different people, well, four people in different states. We get on Skype once a week and we do this podcast. But we try to come at it from a humorous, not sketch comedy. We're not the daily show. But we try to have a light take on it. And we kid around with each other. We like each other. So it, it has the feel of four good friends who have very definitive political views. Sometimes we disagree. A lot of the time we agree. But we talk about the news of the week. And we been very successful with that. Right now, we're getting anywhere between six to 8,000 listeners an episode. I'd like to grow that, but I think it's not bad for a mom and pop mm -hmm. podcast that doesn't have a producer. And, you know, I do the whole thing myself. I, you know, I put together, well, we put together the lineup. Uh, we record it, not unlike what you and I are doing right now. Then I edit it for hours and hours at a time. And I'm sure you know what that's like. And then I post it and people listen to it. So um, I guess if there's a takeaway from that is that there'll, there'll be times in your career when you're going to want to reinvent yourself and take a risk, even at an advanced age. But there's nothing wrong. If, if you can otherwise meet your responsibilities, pay your bills, and you're not going to be sleeping in your car, or you're going to not, not be making your kids homeless, that's okay. I mean, not, it's not okay to make your kids homeless. No. I'm saying taking a risk, and, you know, following, even if it's not a dream, even if it's just something that you find more interesting, if you can find a way to make it work, you know, you, you get one life and try to do what you want to do instead of doing what you have to do. Definitely. Definitely. And I'm, I'm reading a uh, quitter by John Acuff and he's, he uh, mentioned, or he mirrors somewhat of what you're talking about that, you know, you're never too old to, to give it another shot to, go and, and reinvent yourself for something new. So yeah. I thought, how, what a coincidence that I'm reading that book and here you are saying it to me. It's just yeah, one of those moments. Became, you know? Reinvent became the buzzword of the 2000s, I think, but it's, but it's real. I mean, I know so many people who've done it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. Awesome. So anything else coming up for you that you want to highlight or is it just the more perfect union? Uh, the more podcast? perfect union podcast, uh, which you can find at mpupodcast.com or on iTunes and Apple podcasts. I also run a couple of Facebook groups. Again, I don't really make any money at them, but it's, it's fun. Uh, one's called open fire politics. There's another one called open fire sex and relationships. There's a third one called open fire food and fitness. Hmm. Um, I, Oh, and we have one that's open fire entertainment, which covers, you know, movies, television shows, books, anything that people do uh, in their leisure time. And uh, we've got, you know, a, a lot of people in these various groups uh, who spend a lot of time there. And it's, I've made so many virtual friends. Now, you and I are actually looking at each other now because yes. we're on Skype. But there are people in these groups that I've known for four or five years, and I've never seen them in person. But I consider them real people, real friends, because I talk to them every day on, on Facebook. I know it's it's de rigueur now. It's it's kind of in to, to put down Facebook and put down social media. And there's a lot of good reasons for that. But there's also a positive side to it. And I, I cherish my fiance sometimes gets mad at me because she thinks I spend too much time on it. It's just, <laughs> you've got all these people that you're talking to all the time. But they're my, my lifeline. And I, I really value that. Yeah. Wow. Awesome. Well, Kevin Kelton, thank you so much for being on the Career Challenges podcast. It's been a lot of fun. I really enjoyed chatting with you. And you keep writing and work on a novel of your own because that's what's going to break you through. Definitely. Thank you. 
Thank you for listening to the Career Challenges Podcast. Visit careerchallengespodcast.com to listen to more episodes and subscribe. And don't forget to schedule a consultation to talk about your book today by visiting workerlywriter.com. That's W-E-C-K-E-R-L-Y-W-R-I-T-E-R dot com.